The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Hebrews, the 8th chapter, ninth chapter, and 10th chapter, um, yeah, of course we won't, you know, well, this is our first study in it. Um, we're, we're in the 8th chapter tonight, and I'm um, looking at, if I can ever find the 8th chapter here. There it goes. We're in the 8th chapter, and we're looking at, um, our primary subject is uh, verse 1 and 2, but I'm going to go through 5. Um, and I want you to pay attention to this opening now the main point in what has been said is this. And we're in the eighth chapter. Okay? And uh, that's kind of interesting that they would point that out to us. And it helps us because they give us a clue. The main point of what has been said. The main point out of what has been said. What has been said from chapter 1 to chapter 10 is the superiority of Christ over all the old covenant and and if you know chapter 1 he's he's superior over creation 2 over angels 3 and 4 over Moses and then the, the superior over the Levitical priesthood We probably, you refer to that in books. You refer to that as the Old Testament. But it's the Old Covenant. And, and the one aspect that he's interested, that he's carrying over, is chapters 5, 6, and 7, which deals with uh, the Levitical priesthood and the su superiority of the priesthood of Christ. And so that's kind of a background to now the main point of what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister, talking about his high priesthood, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. And that, that's in heaven. For every high priest, and this, he's already discussed this, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is, it is necessary that this high, high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, that, no, that's a capital H. That's a reference to Jesus. Now, if he, Jesus Christ, now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. Jesus could have never held the office of priest in his earthly ministry because he was not from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Judah. And he's, and he's reminding us that. Who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to uh, erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. That pattern is a heavenly vision of what should be. I mean, God, God told him exactly how to build the tabernacle and the temple and the whole system. And now, and, and then he goes on to verse 6 and into a, another aspect of it. So I'm looking at the emphasis for my study tonight is, notice the theme, superiority priesthood the, the priesthood of Jesus Christ is superior uh, and he calls it the main point so let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to talk about this and, I, and I'll tell you why this is important well, before I have a word of prayer let me show you why this is important let's hold your place and then go with me to 1 Peter because this is why this is important to you and I um, 1 Peter of uh, the second chapter verse 5 and then verse 9 because listen, 
we're priests after the order of Jesus' priesthood, right? And his is not after Levi, though that, so ours is not either. We're not, our priesthood has nothing to do with the Levitical priesthood, but it has everything to do with the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. So in chapter 2, verse 5, uh, Peter talks about, he mentions uh, the priesthood that we're a part of in verse 5 and 9. He says, you also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You with me? Okay. Then he goes on, and then let's pick it. And so there, there we're called a holy priesthood. Okay? Our priesthood comes through Jesus in verse 9. And listen, every believer is a priest. Not just some, everyone. Verse 9, but you are a chosen race. Now we have a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, at salvation, we're giving, we're giving, we, we are given in Christ a priesthood title. And uh, that's for our service on earth. That's, our, that's part of our service in the church. We're priests. And over the course of this study, we'll talk more about that. But I'm showing you the correlation between what is said in, in Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 and how why this study is important because we're priests in this order. Okay? So let, now let's have a word for prayer. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin if necessary. It would be necessary under these conditions. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't study it as a Christian. An unbeliever can't get it at all. But other than history and whatever. But for a believer, it's a spiritual book for spiritual people. People who've been born again by the gospel of Christ. We believe that he died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. And when we believe that, the power of the gospel, which that is, then the power of the gospel that comes from the power of God is when we believe we're saved by the power of God. So, and the reason is that the Holy Spirit dwells in us because we are in the church age. And this is the dynamics of the Christian life. We are spiritual people because we're born by the Spirit, we live by the Spirit, etc. Now, Carnality, you can't study the Bible if you're a carnal believer, and that means that you have personal sin in your life unconfessed. You can read about this in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3. So what am I going to do about this? I've got sin in my life. I haven't confessed it. I'm carnal. I'm at Bible study. How am I going to get anything from this study? You have to confess your sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, that word cleansed goes back to verse 7. In verse 7, he's talking about salvation, but in verse 9, he's talking about sanctification. And the, whether it's verse 7 and you're coming into the kingdom through the gospel of Christ, it is for fellowship with God. In verse 9, now that you're in the kingdom, it is with it is for fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. And that is the great ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. You can't study the Bible, and that's how you learn the will of God. You, you learn it through the study of his word. And then this is what, how, how that directs your life under the power of the Holy Spirit. So if we confess, our, it, could be, it could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins. It could be sins of the tongue. But they need to be confessed in silence and privacy through your priesthood. There it is, through your priesthood. And so, Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come with us by automobile and those by the Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth tonight as we look at Hebrews 8, as we open a new series of studies on the new covenant. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well. As I said, we started a new study.
uh, in Romans 8, 9, and 10 because I want to deal with the new covenant. We're new covenant people. We're not old covenant people. We're new covenant people. Uh, and so we're going to begin this series with that in mind. We're going to show how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. And why would you ever want to go back to something that's obsolete? You're going to hear as the writer of Hebrew teaches you that the Old Testament is obsolete once the New Testament is in. Obsolete. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Obsolete. In, in, the, in the Hebrews 8.1, notice I put it on your paper, the main point. You know, Horton's always saying, keep the main point the main point or keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah. Uh, the main point is what has been said it goes back to a reference because we know he says specifically about what's been said about the high priesthood, right? Look at, look at verse 1 in uh, that Hebrew, see? Main point, point, point. And it mentions the priesthood, right? The high priesthood. So that's important to us because he doesn't, he doesn't make us go back and look at, read chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but he does make us go back to take a serious look at the subject of what has already been discussed in some length on the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. And so that has brought me to the title of my lesson, The Superiority of the Priesthood of Jesus Christ over the Levitical system of the Old Covenant, over the Levitical system. It is interesting, at least to me, that the writer of Hebrew introduced this subject of the superiority of Jesus' priesthood in Hebrews 3. So since we're in Hebrews, let's go to chapter 3. He introduces this subject. And when he says the main point uh, uh, about the high priesthood, he, he has already discussed it. So I want to show you what he's discussed a little bit of introducing us. And now he's going to get pretty heavy. Chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, he gets pretty heavy. But here we are in uh, uh, chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the ap apostle, the high priest of our confession. That's, that's quite a bold statement. Yeah, I said confession. It's all right. Sure, it's okay. He was faithful to him who, who appointed him as Moses also was in his house. Now, what he's going to prove is the superiority of Christ to Moses that's chapter 3 and 4. For he's been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, and then he goes into a subject matter. Notice he talks about the high priest. He's introduced you to the concept of the high priesthood, Jesus, uh, the apostle and high priest of our confession. All right? Then in the fourth chapter, he, he, he mentions it again, and he's, his subject so far, chapter after chapter, has been the superiority of Christ over the Old Covenant, and he's picking out specific things. Now, I'm in the fourth chapter. I'm looking at verses 14 through 16. And, and uh, a lot of sermons are preached off in this. This is a passage you'll be familiar with. Uh, since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Right? We, so he's talked about it in, ver, in chapter 3, hasn't he? Our confession. Uh, all right? And so, but look, Jesus, when he's on earth, he can't be our high priest because he's not from the right tribe. The old covenant required you to be from the tribe of Levi. Right? So he, he reminds us, that the title of high priesthood comes after his ascension and session. Okay. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all our things as we are and yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Then we, we, we know that, that passage, but sometimes we miss the connection of what the subject matter was in giving it. So 
what Hebrews 3 and 4, when you read it in context of what the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us about the superiority, uh, Matthew 3 and 4 taught the superiority of Jesus Christ in session over Moses. If Christ doesn't die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead, ascend back to the Father and seat at the right hand of God the Father, this isn't going to work. This works after he is seated in session. Seat, in session, we mean seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Okay? Today, we're going to look at four aspects. This is going to be part one. Well, maybe not. No, the, I guess not. The, today, I'm just looking at this. Uh, we're going to look at four aspects of the superior priesthood of Jesus under the new covenant. It is interesting that the superior, superiority of the priesthood of Jesus Christ is based on Two things. It's based on two things. Melchizedek and Jesus' session. And when I say session, I mean he has died on a cross, he's been buried, he's been raised from the dead on the third day, he spent 40 days in post-resurrection period, ascended back to the Father and is seated at the right hand of God. And in session means he's seated doing business. Okay, And so his entire priesthood is connected on two things. Uh, the priesthood under the new covenant is, is two things. Melchizedek and him in session. Melchizedek and him in session. So we'll, we'll try to pound that out for you today. Okay. Point number one. Melchizedek is mentioned in three different passages and periods of biblical history that makes this interesting. He's mentioned in the period of Abraham. He's mentioned in the period of David. Of course, I could include, you know, the period of Moses, you know, but I'm just taking three big ones where he, this, where Melchizedek is discussed. In, uh, he's discussed in the period of Abraham. He's discussed in the period of uh, David. And he's uh, discussed in the, in the period of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the first coming of Christ business. Now, Abraham. I want you to go to Genesis with me. That's the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And I want to look at 14. And I'm just, I'm just paying attention to the subject matter that I'm after, and that's Melchizedek. I'm in the 14th chapter, and Lot has been captured and carried off as a POW. And Abraham, right? And Abraham has gone and rescued him. And I picked the subject matter up uh, after they have the, after they have uh, beat, uh, have won the war and have brought uh, the spoils of warfare home. And they are meeting in what's called the King's Valley. And um, I'm in 14. I'm in Genesis 14. And I'm, if I never get it, I'm looking at 18. Um, you probably have a study Bible. It probably starts at 17. And it talks about them coming back uh, at, with the spoils of warfare in the King's Valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, he was a priest. Now, this is really important because Melchizedek is described as a priest of the Most High God. God the Most High. That's El Elyon in Hebrew. El Elyon. And here's what El Elyon means to you and I. Here's, here's what it means, this title, El Elyon, or God Most High. Because he is the one who blesses this. He's described as El, El Elyon is the God who blesses through grace. Grace blessings flow through it. And here's, he, and here's his description. Pay attention to the word blessed. Are you with me? Because this is all about uh, God most high. And he blessed him. This is Melchizedek now. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, watch it. Watch again. Because you look for key Key words, right? Markers. Here's the third time the word blessed is used. Blessed be God most high, who has delivered our enemies into your hand, and he gave them a tenth of all. And this whole concept is blessings that flow through the grace of God 
to uh, believers, okay? And so we have this, this um, Abraham. Now, notice what I'm going to say here in this. In Genesis 14, 18 through 20, Melchizedek's priesthood is identified with the Abrahamic covenant. Who is he talking with? Abraham. Abraham is already under covenant. That, that began in, in Abraham covenant, covenant, began in the chapter 12. Right? The, the, the Abrahamic covenant is laid out in chapter 12. And so, we, Melchizedek's priesthood is identified with the Abrahamic covenant about somewhere around six, seven hundred years before Moses and the Levitical priesthood ever came into existence. Now, that, when you look at history, that doesn't seem like a long time, but when you look at your calendar, that's a pretty long time. Right? It is interesting that this meeting took place in Canaan. The meeting between Melchizedek and Abraham this is not a coincidence, right? There's no coincidence in the plan of God, right? This pleading, this meeting was planned. But in order for this meeting to take place, now look, I, I says it shows God's amazing grace plan working on behalf of spiritually advancing believers. Look, for this meeting to take place, if you understand about the Eternal Life Conference, how all that's set up, right? For this to take place, now pay attention to this. God has to take Abraham from the Ur of the Mesopotamian and bring him all the way over into the land of Canaan and have him arrange to meet, to set up his headquarters in Hebron. And bring Melchizedek at the proper time out of the area of where ancient, you know, Salem was ancient Jerusalem and bring them both, now listen to me, into a little speck of earth called the King's Valley after Abraham with 318 go out and beat a huge coalition army. Now that's a whole lot of God. That's not a whole lot of Abraham. That's a whole lot of God. And let me tell you something. This is the way God works in your life if you pay attention. Your life is filled with a whole lot of God and a little bit of you and things will go good for you. When your life is filled all up with you and a little bit of God, things never work well for you. And this is a marvelous thing that God has got Abraham in the right frame of mind to meet Melchizedek. And I'm going to tell you, there are no chance meetings in our life. There are none. And you need to embrace it no matter what's coming down. Listen, it was, it was important that, Ab that, that Abraham go and rescue Lot bring the spoils back and see God do something impossible. 318 farmers go out and beat a high-skill high army. Reminds us of our revolution. A bunch of farmers picking up pitches and old shotguns and fighting a high-skilled army. But anyhow. And so we have Abraham. Melchizedek meets with Abraham by divine decree. Then, then we move on to David. And here's a great one. I want you to go to Psalms 110.4. This is all over the Bible. David pins this. This is a biggie. I mean, this one, this one stretches through the first and second coming of Christ. This is, now we're, we're getting close. You know, things are heating up in the pages of the Word of God. In the plan of God, things are heating up when David writes this. <clears throat> A Psalm of David, verse 4, 110 four Psalms. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever. That word forever is a key. 
according to the order of Melchizedek. You know why Psalms 110 is important and why verse 4 is important? Look at verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, set up my right hand. You know what that is? That, that's, the, that's the Lord Jesus Christ in session. Set up my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. This, listen, this is all about the second coming of Christ, but there can't be a second unless there's a first. There has to be as much victory in the first as Abraham had before he met Melchizedek. That's, and, and probably the verse that you know most about, a lot about, is Psalms 110, 1. We call that Operation Footstool in eschatology. Eschatology meaning study of the last days. Yeah, that's, that's a biggie. Melchizedek, therefore, Melchizedek is identified with the Davidic covenant. See, these are two huge Messianic covenants. They're called unconditional covenants. You got the Abrahamic covenant, you got the Davidic covenant, and you got the new covenant. These are lights out. Messianic covenants. Melchizedek is identified now, is now identified, right? David writes about him, right? With, it connects with the high priesthood of the, of the Messiah, of the Messiah, and connects him a priesthood that is forever, meaning he has to be, he can't be alive and be forever. So Melchizedek is identified with the Davidic covenant about 500 years after the Levitical priesthood. That's taking from Moses to David. Now look. Who do you think's in charge of your years? Why do you worry about them? You know, he's a child. Listen, you were born and will die, and he's in control of all of that, plus the days in between. Listen, it... If you're going to worry, don't worry at all. Listen, live one day at a time. And when you, when you struggle with that idea, just go back and, and listen to Jesus teach you how to pray. Right? Give us us what? Not our weekly, not our monthly, not our yearly. Never our daily. And listen. Slug it out that day. Walk with God. Let God carry you through your day no matter how it looks. Let him have it. Let him have that day. And, and therefore, you can lay your head in the pillow that night and sleep because, listen, I, I slugged it out and did the best I could. I'm confident. I honored God as best I knew how. I'm sleeping. I'm not going to sit up and worry about something I can't control. Only thing I control is how I handled my day. You know, wonderful things going on in within at least the southern culture, and I guess probably everywhere, but I haven't been everywhere. I've just been in the south, and then I've been pretty much in Birmingham, pretty much in center point. So <laughs> there's my life. People use this word all the time. They, they Listen, they say, have a what day? What kind of day? Blessed, Blessed day. That's what we're talking about. You know what all that's connected to? That's the whole story of Melchizedek is the word blessed. And you know what that's connected to? Jesus Christ. You want to have, listen, every day is a blessed day. Every day is a blessed day. In the morning, start with that concept and keep it that way. Every day is a blessed day. When people say, have a blessed day, I tell them, I, I'm having one. What about you? How's your day going? Do I need to pray for you? Because I'm having a blessed day. I'm going to have a blessed day in the morning, afternoon, evening. I'm going to go home and go to sleep tonight because I've had a blessed day. I'm not going to let my day get on top of me. Listen, God, God put me in control of my day. That day doesn't control me. I control that day. I'm in Christ. I'm a position superior to the creation. Do you know that? I said every day in the one who created it. I don't know. That, that's, 
that, that's didn't cost anything. That was free. Then we got Jesus Christ. He comes into the earth. He comes in. You know, we call it the incarnation. Melchizedek is identified with the incarnate Christ Jesus. Who fulfills both the Abraham and the Davidic covenant. Hebrews, the seventh chapter, shows us that the Levitical priesthood ceased with the session of Jesus Christ. Right? Look. When he sits down at the right of God, hand of God and the Father in heaven, that's called session. We call that session in theology. That's called session. He's in business. He's doing business. He's up and running. That's what I'm talking about. And when he does, he is now the high priesthood fulfilling the prophecy of Melchizedek that was put into the Abrahamic covenant and was put into the Davidic covenant, these two unconditional covenants that are going to be wound up into the new covenant, unconditional new covenant. That's as good as it gets, people. I mean, you just had a blessed day here. That's, that's, that's so much information. Listen. And you can see how God is preparing this. For example, he, he put the Levitical system out of order while Jesus Christ was still on the cross. He put the Levitical system. The key part of the whole Levitical system was a pri, pri, high priesthood going into the Holy Holies once a year at, the, at atonement for the sins of the people. And you know what happened when he died on the cross? The veil of the temple, that is the veil that separated the holy place from the holies of holies, was dropped. From, and you know what the Bible says? This, I put it on your paper, Matthew 27. It's dropped from the top to the bottom so that nobody could miss that deal. Right? And that, you know what's out of business? The whole Levitical system. The whole of that. Listen, the temple's out of business. Now, they'll still keep doing business. They still keep doing it because they're apostate. But listen, if you're a Jew, you can get saved. <laughs> I mean, the Jew came to save you. What's he talking about? I mean, he died on the cross for your Jewish sins. You don't need a goat or a, a lamb. You need the lamb of God, the, the human that came into the world to save you. Die on the cross for your sins, buried and raised to give you life everlasting. Don't die an old goat. That ain't going to get you. And so we begin to see God prepare this whole thing at the death of Christ. Now we're waiting for it to ascend now and be seated at the right hand of God the Father and a whole new system is going to be established, right? A whole new, a whole new priesthood system is going to be established. And he gave him a forewarning on it. Boom. Then it was taken out. Then it's taken out by the fifth cycle of divine discipline in 70 AD, right? Rome comes in and drops, them, drops the whole nation of Israel in there and tears the temple down, tears it down. You think, you think, listen, you think any power in this world could have took the temple down without God signing off on it? Listen, if you touch the ark, you got killed. <laughs> Jeez. And you know a great read for you? Listen to me. I, on your paper, circle this, and, and maybe you can remember. It's a short read. It won't take just having a cup of coffee in the morning, telling God you're so happy to be alive and blessed. Read this little passage. Matthew 23, 34 to 39. Pay special attention when Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Please read that. Because that's a forewarning of what's coming. Yeah, it's on your 23. It's on the bottom of your paper right there. I love what David wrote in Psalms 110.4. The Lord has sworn. Boy, that's when you pay attention. <laughs> the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Hoo -ah. Here's a second idea. Here's the second point. The writer of Hebrews gave Melchizedek two kingly titles to be applied to Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see this on your paper so you won't have to look it up. Look at right there. I'm at Hebrews 7, 2. Look at this on top of your paper. To whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils. 
was first of all by the translation of his name. He's called King of Righteousness. And then King of Salem, which is King of Peace. Salem is the in the Hebrew is peace. Shalom. Okay. Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ when he is when he takes on Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek's high priesthood and becomes the spokesperson for El Elyon, right? Becomes wears that crown or hat. We are blessed. We are we are lights out blessed. We are lights out blessed. And he wears the title King of Righteousness and King of Peace. Does he wear those titles today? Oh, yeah. Is he seated at the right hand of God? Well, if you believe God. I mean, I don't know. I believe God. I believe that's where he is. All right. That's, see, that's, that was Hebrews 7, chapter, verse 2. So let's talk about peace and righteousness. He wears he wears the crown, the king's crown of righteousness and the king's crown of peace because he's earned a right because he is seated, meaning he has died, buried, resurrected, uh, cl cleaned up everything needs to be cleaned up in 40 days post-resurrected appearance as ascended back to the Father on schedule. He's now in session. Here's how he got the peace. Here's how peace works for us as him is seated at the right hand of God the Father as the high priest. Peace. Listen to, listen to what Colossians, listen to Colossians 1.20. This is found in the book of Colossians and Ephesians. You know, they're sister books. If, so anytime you read something in Colossians, you'd be smart to look at Ephesians because they're going to talk about it too. I, I just took Colossians 1.20. And through him to reconcile all things to himself. And through him to reconcile all things to himself. How many things? Wouldn't it be good if you believe that? No, I know you can read it because, you, you, you know, you, you went to 12th grade. Okay. Well, you can still read it, can't you? You smart thing. Thank you, Suzanne. I needed, I needed to. Why should I take it for granted, right? Let me tell you, that just proves. Listen, she was one of our great students in our class, a graduate from the School of Biblical Theology. She was one of the good, she was one of the good students. So, anyhow, peace. Through him to reconcile all things to himself. All things to himself. See, so reconcile, that's a big word, isn't it? Married, couple come, married couples will come to me and they're having, they don't know it because they're only in their fifth year, that they're just going through fifth year stuff. But they don't know it because they've only been there five they haven't been there 55. And so you work on what? Reconciliation. You know what reconciliation? It's not neither one getting their own way, but both. Of, see, it would be nice if our government knew this. It, neither one getting all what you want, but both are getting enough to be satisfied. And for that, we can link and push forward. That's reconciliation, isn't it? See, see, God has to deal with that on the sin part of us and the righteous part. You know, here we are unrighteous, and he's got a righteous part for us, and he has to reconcile us, and that's done through Jesus Christ. And so for me as a pastor, for me to get reconciliation done with two people, it's more than just a matter, mind and matter, you know. If you don't mind, it won't matter. Remember Mark Twain? Um but anyhow, it, it, listen, for that to really work and, and to be constructive in your life as a building, building bridge so that we can cross, next time we get to that place, we've got a bridge already built that we know how to walk across so we don't stand on each of us, stand on one, end of the, on, one, one on one end of the bridge and one on the other and holler at each other. Well, you come over. No, you come over. Well, I'm not coming over unless you come over. We see, Christ, if we know that Christ is the bridge and Christ is the, the key of this whole thing, then it makes it much easier. Both of you surrender to Christ and I'll talk to you. That's why I tell them. 
Because they come in, well, he tells me this, and she tells me this, and he tells me this, and he tells me that. Whoa, stop. First of all, let's find out what Christ tells us both. Maybe we'll have a solution to this whole thing. Nine times out of ten, that is. Right? The only reason it's nine out of ten, not ten out of ten, because one won't hear it. Anyhow, I feel better. Thank you. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace. See, so that's what you're after in reconciliation, right? Peace. Now, listen, you, you can't go to sleep without it. You know, you, you toss and turn all night. Then you get up and you think, well, I think I'll go watch a little something. And then, then you get more depressed by watching anything on the news. Then you go, ah, shoot, I think I'll go back to bed. Then you toss and turn. Listen, you could save yourself a whole lot. Just, have, just stop and have some prayer with the Father about it and say, look, what I'm struggling about, I know has already been settled with you. Give me that peace. In Galatians 5, 22 says the fruit of the Spirit is peace. And you turn, you turn it over. You stop. Your flesh is the only one worrying. The spirit, your spirit doesn't worry. As soon as you can calm your, your flesh down by, by talking to your spirit in the, with wisdom, your spirit will go like, let's go to bed. I'm tired. Then you sleep like a baby, and then you can't get them up at 8 o'clock. Go like, is it 8 o'clock already? It feels like I just went to bed. Well, you just did. Well, anyhow, having, having made peace through, the, watch this, through the blood of his cross, you can't get peace any other way. <coughs> this is true reconciliation. This is true peace. This is peace that passes all understanding, that works in your life in the most mysterious and magnificent ways. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or in heaven. And here is righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him. He made him. God made Christ for us. Who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? You know, for me, when I have those moments in my life where you go like, I don't know if I would do this or that. I don't know. I sing old rugged cross. Now this works for me. You probably got a hymn in there somewhere. But for me, when I when I began to sing the old rugged cross, it takes me back to when I got saved because that was the song. The invitational. That was the message and the invitational song. And so when I get all wound up with what is gonna happen and what's this gonna be and what then eh, and I can feel that just getting all bound up in goofy stuff. And I can't get my soul settled down. I just, I sing the, the old work of cross and it just takes me back to where it was all simple and clean. And What are you talking about, Ron? On a hill far away. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Listen, do you know it's a, what you're worrying about is a privilege, but you don't need to worry about it. You need to submit it to the Father. Don't you know that? Yes, sir, I know that. Well, then let's, let's go ahead and get this done and go to bed. we got a busy day tomorrow. Here's the third thing. Oh, uh, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that reason, this is a divine purpose, so that we might become the righteousness that we might. He made him so he could make us. He made him sin so he can make us righteous. He made him sin so when we believe that, he makes us righteous. It, we're not righteous because of what we do in our relationship with Christ. It's positional righteousness that he's talking about here. Here's point three. The Hebrew writer gave Jesus another title called Prince of the Most High God. Priest, I mean priest, not prince. Priest of the Most High God. He suggested this 
when he was with Melchizedek in, in, in Hebrews, uh, or in Genesis 14, uh, 18 and 22, and he discussed it uh, in connection with Jesus in Hebrews 7, 1 and 2. God revealed to him, uh, revealed himself to Melchizedek as El Elyon, which we discussed a moment ago. And when you read, when you read Genesis, you pay attention to the number of times the word blessed is used, which I showed you when we went through Genesis 14, 19, um, uh, uh, 18 through 20. You pay attention to that. Blessed be, the, blessed be Abraham, God, uh, God, God most high. Blessed be God most high is, is the principle. And, uh, and let me show you. Let me show you. Uh, or let me just tell you. Write this on your paper. Write this down. You can look at it later. But do you know where you find this word in the New Testament? Let me tell you. You find it in Matthew 5 in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. The King James called it the Beatitude. And it is the word blessed right as we've been looking at it. And he goes through this whole thing in, in, this, in, the, in Matthew 5, 1 through 12, he uses this word nine times. I mean, it leads off every, every time, doesn't it? And he tells you what, what, is, what, what, is, what is already there for you. Now, how do you get access to it? Only through me. God has set this program up, and the only way you can, that, that can be given to you is through Christ. And sometimes that's often missed because people, some people will say, well, that's probably for the Jewish age and it's probably for this and probably for that. They miss what the content of importance is. You understand? Why he, why, and, and guess who's pounding this? I mean, guess who's teaching this? And, and there's your word blessed and that's an important thing. And, and um, Jesus is, is forewarning. He's, he's putting this out, showing you how this thing is going to work. And, you, and the only way you're ever going to be blessed is in Christ. Because that blessing comes from El, El Yon, and the only way to get that is through Christ. No man, listen, John 14, 6, no man can come to the Father except through him. No one. I mean, he even had to tell, oh, wise guy, Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus. I mean, he had more degrees than anybody should have in theology. He went to the very... You know, but but Nicodemus, you got to be born again, son. You got to be born again. I mean, how simple was that? Well, anyhow, this name, El, this El Elyon, this name emphasized to Abraham that Yah, his Yahweh God, is superior to all other so-called gods of the world. And you know who told him that? Melchizedek. And why would that be important to Abraham? Listen to me. Because Abraham came out of a cultural background and practice of polytheistic idolatry. It's recorded in Joshua 24.2. I put it on your paper for you. See it there? Yes. Joshua 24.2. And also, if you want reading about this type of thing, you can look at Acts 17. You know, there were, you know, they were collecting every statue to every god. You know, they were doing that. Uh, Paul told them, I got one to add. They wouldn't do it, but anyhow. Look, this same idea is brought out. Now, look, go to Luke with me. This is brought out in, uh, in uh, we call them Christmas uh, hymns of the birth of Christ. And in Luke... This, I, uh, this idea of, of the Messiah uh, uh, bringing El Elyon, Elyon in Luke 1, uh, uh, the first one is Mary's, I think I wrote down, the, j just because in the order, I, uh, Luke 149, um, Luke 149, uh, Mary's Magnificat, her hymn, uh, it starts up in verse 46, look at verse 48. Uh, oh, for 49. Um, for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. And that's that concept. 
that mighty God that's done great things that brought great blessings to my life? That's Mary. That's Mary's great hymn. And she's making reference uh, to this El Elyon, this mighty God that brings great blessings. And, and we, we know that story pretty well because of the, of the Christmas. And then uh, uh, Zechariah's hymn, you know, the father of John the Baptist, uh, in Luke 1, uh, 79, uh, he writes uh, the, he, his hymn, we call it Benedictus, uh, his hymn, uh, uh, because of the word blessed, blessed, which is in verse 68, but I'm looking at uh, verse uh what did I write down? 70, um, 76. In 76, um, he, and he, he says, and you, child, talking about John the Baptist now, and you, child, will be called, and, and, and listen, this is the Lord giving him through him, right? And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. See what we see there? We're in the same El, El, El Yan concept. And see how this thing started blessed in 68? Now, now he's talking about it. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his way. And then he goes on to talk about that. You see? we Again, we have another reference that's really important to this subject matter. I better keep that. Uh, listen, in the millennial age, according to Zechariah 6.13, I put it on your paper, in the fulfillment of Psalms 110.4, in the millennial age, Jesus Christ will reign as both priest and king. In the millennial age. And uh, it talks about a priest on, the, listen, it's most interesting. Zechariah, now you got to pay attention when you're in places like this, but in Zechariah 6.30, it refers to him as a priest sitting on a throne. <laughs> a giving counsel, giving the counsel of peace. That's yeah, so good. People, that's so good stuff. Aren't you glad you came tonight? It's just so, it's just such good stuff here that relates to our life. Point four. Jesus Christ was not called priest until after his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and session. We saw that. I don't know if we saw it, but in Hebrews, let me, let me, did I write? Oh, it's on your paper. Hebrews 7, 3. Look at the very bottom at point four. Where the writer describes Melchizedek without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning nor uh, of days nor end of life, be made like the son of God. He remains a priest forever. Now, what's important is this priest forever. In prophecy, listen, Psalms 110, 4. David makes this very clear. When he writes his psalms, you are a priest forever. A priest forever. Once he gains that title, he is never going to lose that title. We've seen him sitting on the throne with that title. We've seen him come into the second advent with that title. This is a title he has forever. Forever. I mean, we like anything that's connected with us forever on Jesus' side of the page. Right? According to the order of Melchizedek. In Hebrews 5, 6, in Hebrews 5, 6, when he's talking about it, just as he says in another passage, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Jesus had, listen, Jesus had a father, Jesus had a mother, Jesus had a genealogy, Jesus had a beginning and an end of life. And yet he is Melchizedek's order forever. How did that happen? Resurrection, ascension, and session. Boom. You understand how he got forever? You know how you get forever? You get forever in Christ, or you don't get forever in a positive, but for, blessed forever. Uh, so, I want to close. I want you to go to Hebrews with me and look at the seventh chapter with me a minute, because we started out the main point, right? The main point that I've previously spoken about and that would take us to chapters 5, 6, and 7, and especially 7. And so here we are in the 7th chapter, verses 14 through 17. Uh, and it, at point 4, I have it written, Hebrews 7, 3, and then 14 through 17. And so I'm going to read that, then we're going to close. 
I'm going to give you uh, some other scriptures to write down, then we're going to close. Um, for it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. That's the law. And this is clearly still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of the law of physical requirements, Judah versus Levi tribes, but according to the power of indestructible life. That's life after death, people. For it is witness of him, thou art a priest forever, according to order of Melchizedek. Isn't that good? And see, because he lives forever, we sing these hymns. Because he lives forever, we live forever in him. He is a priest forever, and so are we. Now, write these verses down. I don't think they are anywhere. We started with it, though. 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. That's who you are. This whole thing, this whole thing of Jesus' priesthood, he invites you. At, at, he does invite you to be a priest, but at the point of salvation, one of the 50 things you receive at the point of salvation is priesthood. You receive it. You are a priest, whether you care, whether you... Whether you like it or not. <laughs> I suggest you like it, but but you are one positionally. Okay? So that's important. And and listen, when you read that, it's about spiritual service. Do you remember that? Your priest for spiritual service in the in the house of God, spiritual service in the house of God of which you are. You remember that? Well, listen, here's the verse that's important for that. You put down, now Romans 12, 1 and 2 will make sense to you. Because this is what it's about. That spiritual service, that's at Romans 12, 1, and then he goes into 2 and talks about transformational life. L living what you are positionally Christ out into your everyday life where, where you're content with that. You know, God's always content. It's, it's us that we have to work, <laughs> have to work at it, right? I do. Man, I don't mind telling you. Uh, I chase squirrels all day in the church. And half the time I was chasing a squirrel, and the squirrel was the other half the time he was chasing me. <laughs> and I thought about that. I was telling, I thought about that song, Mississippi Squirrel. That's the only song that could go through. I mean, where, where's those hymns when I need them? The only thing was this Mississippi Squirrel upstairs uh, uh, my pest, my pest control guy and me, with brooms, and half the time we'd chase him down. The other time, he, <laughs> yeah, if somebody had a film, it was too, it was too funny. But, um, so my my point in all that was just foolishness. But my point is this Romans twelve two, this Romans twelve verse one and two is really important about where your spiritual service is in the house of God. And then also write down Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. These will be really important for you. Because listen, we are a priest. Not like the Levitical priesthood, but like the priesthood of Christ, whose, whose priesthood comes after. We're priests of the new covenant, not the old covenant. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. Okay. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll go into our private time of prayer. Let's see. I had, well, maybe I'll think about it in a minute. Let, let, let's close this session down. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come our way by automobile and the Internet to sit at our table to be fed the Word of God. May the Holy Spirit take it and bring it into the reality of truth in their life. Clean out whatever, Father, is necessary out of this sermon in order to bring it into the solidness of truth in their life. I pray that the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he tells us it is. And I pray for that. I pray for that. We are priests. 
of the Lord Jesus Christ under the new covenant. We are priests of God. And we have a message just as big as Melchizedek. When Melchizedek meets with Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant and encourages him to be the messenger of Christ. And if he will hold tight to that message, El Elyon will bless his life beyond measure. May we understand that in Jesus Christ today, Father, as priest. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.